The most important American Christian you've probably never heard of. Are you ready to meet a man who during the founding of the United States was known as one of New England's finest minds, a name largely forgotten in American history, but deserving of every bit of recognition. April 19th, 1775, War is looming over Lexington, Massachusetts. Name Small, Miss Small. Colonists stood hastily armed, facing a formidable British force of over 700 redcoats. The entire British Empire was built on cups of tea. Tensions begin to escalate, leading to the infamous clash that ignited the American Revolutionary War. As the sun rose, the unprepared colonists were confronted by a British major demanding they surrender. The first shots are fired acclaims the lives of eight colonists. The British advance. They set fire to the town. But beyond its borders awaited the courageous Minutemen, numbering in the thousands. Among them was a newly freed slave, driven by his passion for Christianity and people. In the aftermath of the initial skirmish, this man actively participates in engagements, caring for the wounded, and he, he witnesses just the brutality of war. And at the sight of blood and death, this fueled a deep conviction within him, a vow to fight for the extension of freedom and liberty to all men and women in the colonies. Meet an unsung hero whose commitment to justice and equality played a pivotal role in shaping the destiny of a nation. On a warm summer day in West Hartford, Connecticut, the dawn of July 18th, 1753, it witnesses the arrival of this unsung hero into the world. His lineage bore the complexity of a Scottish immigrant as a mother, an enslaved African-American father residing and laboring on a plantation. He ends up being abandoned by both of his parents. He was an unwelcomed infant and found himself bound as an indentured servant to the household of David Rose in Granville, Massachusetts. His days unfoiled as he toiled the fields and while nights were dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge in the plantation schools. And there was this customary ritual on Saturday evenings in the household which involved the reading of sermons from the local church. And on one such occasion, he took the stage and delivered a sermon that so stirred the souls of those present that everyone afterwards wanted to know, where did you find that sermon? And with boldness, he declared, I wrote it myself. Upon reaching the threshold of 21 years, the chains of servitude released their grip granting him the coveted gift of freedom. However, with the newfound liberty, he embraced the calling of duty, enlisting in the ranks of the local militia, erecting a sturdy stone abode in close proximity. The echoes of destiny, they summoned him to confront the British forces, embroiling him in significant skirmishes and campaigns that tested his mettle on the battlefield. And in those moments of respite, his soul found solace in the artistry of poetry in the Old and New Testament. This call of duty, it took a distinct turn as he joined the esteemed ranks of Ethan Allen's Green Mountain Boys. And he contributes in a number of different capacities. However, the rigors of warfare, they eventually lead him back to the familiar grounds of Granville, Massachusetts. He falls ill and he has to leave the call of duty. Yet adversity didn't stifle his intellectual pursuits. He resumes his farming responsibilities and he embarks on a scholarly journey, going into the realms of Greek and Latin under the guidance of two local reverends who graciously undertook the role of mentors in his theological education. His active religious intellect and the gift of oratory were undeniable forces. An encouragement from his community echoed loudly, recognizing his unwavering zeal for ministry and pastoring and they had been evident since his youth. So stepping into the realm of theological examination, he effortlessly triumphs over the pastoral licensing exam. Do you know how easy this is for me? Etching his name in history 
as the first black man in America to be bestowed with the honor of pastorship. His name is Emil Haynes. In the Bible, Emil means belonging to God. King Lemuel is only mentioned once. It's found in the book of Proverbs. It's the last chapter in Proverbs from a message from a mother to her son to belong to God and never leave. Haynes viewed that as his personal calling. He took the first 10 verses of Proverbs 31 as his own personal call and exhortation to live a life belonging to God. In November 1780, Haynes receives the divine mandate to preach and with unwavering purpose, he answers the summons at the Venerable Congregational Church of Middle Granville. This hallowed calling etched his name in history again as the inaugural African-American minister entrusted with the spiritual guidance of an all-white congregation. The sacredness of his journey continues to unfold, weaving a narrative of a pioneering spirit. In 1785, he ascended to the esteemed position as the first ordained African-American minister, a testament to the way providence was guiding his steps. And amidst all of this, he finds his soulmate. Elizabeth Babbitt, a virtuous white school teacher, had moved from her home to be near Haynes. And at 21 years old, she proposed to Haynes, breaking cultural and social barriers. We marry me. Now, their union blossomed. They end up having 10 children. And the winds of destiny begin to whisper a new chapter into his life, leading him to heed the call of the West Parish Congregation in Rutland, Vermont. A congregation that for the next 31 years, he will tend to their spiritual needs, leaving an indelible mark as a shepherd of souls and a beacon of unity in the sacred journey of faith. In the space where theology met ministry, Haynes navigated the intricate dance between the pulpit and the political realm. He was a visionary ahead of his time. He stood firm in his convictions. He refuses to lend support to Thomas Jefferson's presidential bid due to Jefferson's ties to slavery. This principled stance led to his removal from his congregation under the accusation of mixing church and politics. Haynes transcended the narrow confines of his era, recognizing that slavery was not merely a political issue, but a profound matter to God. He staunchly opposed the flawed concept of colonization, rejecting the notion of sending free African Americans and Blacks back to Africa for settlement. His foresight, light years beyond his contemporaries, extended to his vehement opposition to religious sectarianism that condoned slavery. See, at the heart of his theology was his devotion to God. From this wellspring emerged his abolitionist views, interwoven with witty and profound political and religious commentary. Haynes, a trailblazer in every sense, became the first black abolitionist to denounce slavery on purely theological grounds, eschewing the cloak of social, economic, or civic arguments. Community leaders, they sat under the weight of his sermons, and God used his voice like a wave, crashing the truths of justice and freedom. His writing, spanned sermons, social commentary, political dissertations, and musings that laid bare the direction of the nascent American nation. Politically aligned with Federalist ideals, he threw his support behind candidates like Washington and Adams. Adams, a non-slave owner, shared Haynes' stance against slavery. Washington, having risked life in a state for the country's freedom, emancipated every slave on his farm upon his death a testament to the profound impact of those who dared to forge a path towards justice. His sermons and essays stressed interracial liberty, natural rights, and justice. They were distributed in newspapers, not just nationally, but internationally, making him one of the first African Americans to be published. Haynes also received, on an account, an honorary Master's of Arts degree from Middlebury College is that at second commencement in 1804, only the fourth degree given by the school. And you probably guessed it, the first ever to an African-American.
nearly 150 years after his death, a manuscript written by Haynes around 1776 was discovered, in which it states, Liberty is a jewel which was handed down to man from the cabinet of heaven.